In Ephesians, and in Ephesians, Paul is writing to the to the church at Ephesus, and and he's encouraged by them and their faith. and And I, I just want to let, let y'all know, y'all have really encouraged me, like I said, and and confirmed, uh, help, helping give me the confirmation that I'm right where I need to be. And and I, I love you guys, but uh, we're we're in this series called Identify Yourself. Identify yourself. We're working way, our way through. Paul's letter. We're finishing up chapter 1 today. We're going to be starting at verse 15. If you want to go ahead, if you have your Bibles or if you're taking notes, you can write that down. We're going to go all the way through the end of uh, chapter 1 this morning. But our primary goal here is to help you find your identity in Christ so that you know that you are loved and valued and highly favored as a child of the one true king. And we, a lot of times in our society, even in the church, we put our identity in things outside of Christ. And God created us. He, he made us in his image. And, and uh, in Christ is the only true place to find who we really are. And uh, the things we do and, and the things we've done and all those things, those things don't define who we are. And we want to help you understand that. And so far, we've looked at a couple of different ideas here. We, we talked about, uh, the title of the first message was, I am blessed. And we looked at a lot of these blessings that come from, from God. And last week, the title of the message was, I am redeemed. And we looked at the redemption we have in Christ and more, just a kind of a continuation of the blessings that God's given us. And today, we're going to wrap up the first chapter and with a message that I've uh, called, I can know him. <clears throat> I can know him. <laughs> That's awesome, isn't it? When you think about it, oh man. Um, I can know him. And, and there's some significance. It's, it's mainly verse 17. I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and look at verse 17. To be honest with you, I hadn't planned on doing this. But, but uh, let's look at verse 17 real quick before we jump in anywhere else. It says, Paul writes, and, and this is kind of after he kind of gets things rolling a little bit, but he says this, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. He's praying for the church, and this is one of the things he's praying for, that the spirit of God will give you this wisdom and reveal to you the knowledge of him. And this is where the main idea for this message comes from. We can know him. He's, of course, he's talking about God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can know him. And so uh, that, that's where that comes from. And, and this uh, idea of knowing him, it's, it's, uh, I, I want to illustrate it to you in, in a way. I, I was thinking about this, and it's been quite a few years ago, and I guess it was around tw 2003, I was uh, doing a youth retreat, and I knew most of the kids there, uh, and um, I had known almost all of them, probably at least a year or so maybe, and, and I'm guessing about, about the exact time, I don't remember exactly, but, but um, it was at, during the climax of a popular uh, pop artist called Britney Spears, y'all remember her? Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, she was really popular, you know, uh, during that time, and um, so I, I, I shocked the, the crowd of the teenagers, or a small crowd, but I shocked them when all of a sudden I said, hey, I said, um, I don't know, I don't remember if I've told you all this, but, but uh, I know Britney Spears. And they were like, I seen them kind of looking around, you know, and then I broke the news to them that although I knew her, I knew her just like all the rest of the world knew her, I knew who she was, I knew a few of the songs she sang and, and that kind of thing. And, and it was a big letdown, I'm sure, for him. But, but uh, <clears throat> you know, I know who she is. You know who she is. But I don't have a real relationship with her, you know. And uh, it, it, was, it was a big letdown for him. I, I think they were hoping she was there or something. But, but uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, didn't have a relationship with her. We didn't share any stories together or, we, you know, or anything like that. It was just a surface knowledge, not an intimate knowledge in any way of, of, of her. And, and I did that to illustrate something that I'm trying to illustrate to you this morning is, you know, unfortunately, 
That's how most of the world knows the Lord Jesus Christ. They know who he is. They know a few stories about him. They know a few songs, maybe, you know, that he, that, about him. But they don't really know him. You know? They don't really know him. And, you know, the sad truth is there's a lot of folks in our churches who really don't really know Jesus. They don't have a real relationship with him at all. And uh, thank the Lord, you know, your relationship with him doesn't have to be like some, like it is with some distant superstar that you only see on TV. You know, your relationship with the creator of the universe can be an intimate relationship. You can know him. Did you know that? You can really know him. The question today is, do you? Do you really know him? Well, that's what we want to know. Uh, that's, that's what we need to know. And, and so, uh, if you will, uh, let's read our text together. I'm going to read from God's word, beginning in Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 15. Follow along with me as we read read it uh, he says for this reason and referring back I guess for all all the things that God has done and blessed us with he says and because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints I do not cease to give thanks for you remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this word of truth. And uh, Lord, today we're thankful that you're not just a distant God who's out there somewhere watching and just uh, observing. But Lord, you have sought us Lord, you have become flesh, and Lord, you uh, have made it so that we can really know you and experience you forever. And so this morning, Lord, we're so thankful for that. Speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord. Help us to know you more fully and love you more freely. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he just finished this introduction that we're talking about, and he expresses this prayer. He says, look, you know, I've heard about you and um, your faith and your love, and, and, and I want to pray that through the Spirit of God that you know him. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. And, and uh, Paul prays this prayer, and, you know, here's the question. That I guess that we have for you guys, you know, and and you, or, do you really want to know Jesus? Do you really, really want to know Him? And do you really, really know Him? That's the important thing. And and we look at our text this morning. I want us to see three truths. How do I call them? Three consoling truths, I guess. That that we can know if we really know Him, and we learn these things about God and. And as we know him, we, we realize these, these truths. And they're things that we see right in the text. I think that he's trying to help encourage 
the church at Ephesus with, and I think he can encourage us in knowing our great God. Number one is this. If you really know God, if you know him, then you can know his love. You can know his love. When he, when he starts off here in this party, in verse 15 and 16, he's emphasizing this giving thanks continue. He says, I've heard of your faith, and I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So he's saying, look, I, I'm continually praying for you guys. And, and then he talks about what he's praying for. He's praying that they know him and, and all these other things that we're going to look at. But here's one thing I, I don't want you to miss, and I think it's important because it's tied into knowing Christ and having that relationship with him. Is he, he says, look, I've heard of your faith. You see that? In the Lord Jesus. And your love toward all the saints. So uh, what we see is, He's encouraged by them because he's heard that they love Jesus and they love people. And that's what happens when you know the Lord. Look, look you know, it, it, there's some people uh, that maybe you've encountered in your life when you're around them, you just fall in love with them, you know, because they're nice to you, maybe they're generous and that kind of thing, and, and you just fall in Well, listen, when, let me tell you something. When you really know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you really know him, you're going to fall in love with him. You're going to fall in love with him. And, and that's just the way that it is. The people that don't love Jesus, they don't really know Jesus. You know, They know about him maybe, but they don't really know him. Because when you really know him and you realize how much he loves you, then you're going to fall in love with him. And that's just the way that it is. And, and then when you fall in love with the Lord, then uh, because he loves others, then you're going to love others. And this is what Paul is pointing out. He's showing that this faith and this love is being demonstrated through the lives of these people. They love one another. You remember, Jesus says it a lot in his, in, uh, and we read it a lot in the New Testament in, in John. And one of the passages that we talk about is John chapter 13 where Jesus says this and he tells his disciples, he says, look, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so, you know, what, you know what this world needs to see more than anything else? Our world needs to see people, the people of God. Our world needs to see the people of God love people. That's what this world needs to see. Because when they see the people of God love people, they see the love of God. And that's what Paul was saying he could see in the people at the church of Ephesus. The, that love for people comes from a real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you say you love Jesus, then it should show itself in the way you love people. And I'm telling you this morning, if you know him, if you really know him, you have a relationship with him, then that love for him and that love for people is going to show itself. And that's just the truth this morning. And, and uh, you know, you can know his love. That's what we're talking about. If you know him, you can know his love. A young lady sent this lamenting letter to her ex fiance. I should have had it on the, on the screen so you could see it, but I'm going to read it to you. See if you can pick up on the love she has for him. She says, Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever, Marie. And then she has a postscript. She says, congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> oh, man. Now that's love, right? That is love. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it sounds a little bit maybe like self-love, doesn't it? But 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 here's what I want you to understand. I, I know this: when you realize how much Jesus loves you, and when you believe in faith and receive the transforming power of His salvation, it's much better than winning the lottery. You get a lot more than anything this world can give you. When you receive and accept the love of Jesus, 
you get more than this world could ever offer. And I want to tell you this morning, He has loved you with an indescribable love. And when you call out to Him in faith, and you know Him in His grace, you experience that love, and you can share that love with others. Listen to me. Your identity is found in the love of Jesus. You are who you are because Jesus loves you. <laughs> and that's never going to change. And your value is never going to be diminished because he will never love you less. And he can't love you more than he already does. You can know him and you can know his love. But not only that, not only can you know his love, but you can know his hope. That's the second consoling truth that I want you to understand. When you know the Lord, when you really know Him, you not only know His love, you can know His hope. And I, We see this mainly in verse 18. We look at this uh, uh, in verse 18. He says this phrase. He says, well, first let's look at this phrase. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Do you see that? Now, if you've been around me much, and I've prayed it up here, you'll hear me, I pray this often, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we can see you and know you more fully and, and obey you and these kind of things. And, and, and that, this is where I get that from, you know, this, this, this kind of prayer that Paul's praying here. And, and listen, if, if you want to pray, and sometimes we don't know how, we, how to pray, I'm going to tell you, pray this. Start at verse 15. And just pray all the way down through verse 23. And you pray this prayer for yourself and for our church and for me and for everybody else. You pray this prayer. Because this is an awesome prayer. You know, and this is what we need to be praying. This is the word of God. But looks what he, you know, and I often pray for God to open the eyes of our hearts that we might know him more fully, understand the truths of his word. And this is Paul praying for God's people at Ephesus. And he's praying that they may see and understand and know the Lord Jesus. And to know, look what he says here, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. You see that? This is where we're getting this. We can, you can know his hope. Jesus has given us a great hope. Do you realize that? Oh, man. <laughs> a great hope. And... and and um, it's the hope of your calling. You know? And hope here, it's not like the, the, the hope of a child at Christmas, you know, like I hope so. It's, it, it, it's beyond that. You know, it, it's, it's you know, like, not like a child hoping to get a bike at, at, you know, at Christmas. That's not quite what it is. This word has the idea of assurance. <laughs> you know, uh, a little bit of assurance. Uh, I asked for a motorcycle one time when I was a kid, and in my mom and dad's bathroom, I saw on their calendar where they had paid some money to somebody for a motorcycle on a certain date. So my hope was pretty assured that I was getting a motorcycle for Christmas. And I knew not to say anything, because if I did, I probably wouldn't have got one. Uh, but I did, you know. And, and so, but, but this is the kind of assurance we're talking about. If God has promised it, he's written it down. It's as good as what he says, amen? And so that's the kind of hope we're talking about. It, it's beyond just, just something that you're hoping you get, but you're not really sure. There's this great idea of assurance built in with this hope. And you get a hint of it as he's finishing up verse 18 mentioning the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, this is about the third time, I think, that we've really seen this idea of inheritance. And uh, Paul's really, uh, I guess, tuning us in to this idea of what God has in store for us. And oh, man, we can't even begin to imagine what it is, but, but he's drawing on this again. But I think this hope rests in Christ and these things that he's already mentioned. So let's go back to verses 4 through 10, and I want us to look at a few of these things and just, just hit on these things that he's talking about, our inheritance and what we have to look forward to, these things that we hope for. God has called us to be his. How has he called us? He chose us, and he's called us and made it so that we can be holy and blameless before him. Amen? 
because of Christ's righteousness, we can be holy and blameless before him. And we will be because of him. And that's some of that hope. And then he says he's predestined us for adoption as sons. He has made us his own children. Not only just uh, uh, forgiven us of our sins and, and, and plucked us from the depths of hell, but brought us into his own family, into his own house, uh, to uh, enjoy all that he has forever. <laughs> you know, that great inheritance. And then in verse 7, he talks about this redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. And we talked about last week. And, and verse 8, the wisdom and insight. And verse 10, more about the future uniting all things in him. Jesus didn't come just to redeem sinners, but he came, came to redeem the whole universe. And eventually everything is going to be one in heaven. Look what he says in verse 10. Everything in heaven and things on the earth. Oh, man. You see, your faith in Christ is a promise of the things to come and, and a peace in things for now. You know, everything, I, I was thinking about this earlier, everything that, that we receive now, all the grace and blessings that we receive now is just a little picture of what is to come. You know, <laughs> every time there's a healing, you know, every, every time there's anything good that takes place, it's just a little image, a little picture of what eternity's going to be like. And, and God is showing that to us. Right now you experience all these blessings of God imperfectly. But one day there will be a day when we'll all be made like Jesus. Right? Righteous and perfect and enabled to live in God's presence, worshiping Him and serving Him forever and ever. What a day that will be. Right now we do our best. <laughs> You know, and it's pretty fun. And I, I had a great time worshiping the Lord in here this morning. You know, but man, that's nothing. It's nothing compared to what it's going to be like. Because of your faith in Jesus, you can know his hope. You know, um, first George Bush president, when he was vice president, something happened that reminds us of our hope in Christ. And, um, said that he represented the United States at the funeral of a former Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev. It says Bush was deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. He stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. And then just as the soldier touched the lid, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope in a gesture that must rank as one of the most profound <laughs> acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. Think about this. There in the citadel <laughs> of secular atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life and that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross and that that same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. Think about that for a minute. Oh, I'm telling you folks, listen to me. In life's most crucial moments, you won't rely on your government. When you're on your deathbed, you won't say, somebody get the president. It won't happen. You know? Oh, man. When you're faced with overwhelming grief or torment, there's only one place people go for hope. And I'm telling you, that is to the Lord our God. In those moments, people cry out, Oh God, save me! He is our hope. He alone is our hope. Listen to me. My hope is built 
on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's it. That's it. And listen, my eternal identity rests completely and utterly upon him and his work by grace through faith alone. And listen to me, your, you, you will find your identity in Christ. You can find your identity in Christ because you can know him. And you can know his love and you can know his hope that we have and you can also find your identity in Christ in this and you can know his power <laughs> when he wraps this chapter up oh man he starts describing this power of God and, and, and by, listen by making us his own inheritance God has shown us his great love I mean we are part of Christ's inheritance we are he is you know and we get to enjoy all that's his and by promising us an awesome future God has encouraged our hope but now the Apostle Paul reminds us that we can know God's power. When you know, oh, when you know Jesus, when you really know him, you can really experience his great power. You know, think about that for a minute. Oh man. Look at look at these verses with me. We're gonna we're just gonna work our way through them. Um you know, if you've ever needed anything in your life. It's the power of God. You know? And uh, Paul described this power of God. Look what he says. He says, and what he's wanting us to know this. What? That we can know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. To who? Look who it's to. To us who believe. To the people of faith. Those who have faith. That we can know him and know his power. Great power. <laughs> How awesome is that? The, the power of God is immeasurable. There is no scale large enough to measure the power of God. Amen? <laughs> Nothing. And, you know, and, and then he talks about this. Um, he says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So God demonstrated this great power by raising Christ from the dead, didn't he? But not only did, did God's power raise Christ from the dead, he says, but it seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. You see that? God's power raised Christ from the dead, and then he transformed his body, and he went to the right hand of God, a place of power and authority, a place where he already was, I suppose. Uh, you know, and, and he talks in the hand of God in heavenly places. Jesus was exalted to a place above the highest earthly positions. Look what he says. Far above all rule. He uses several words here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to try to help you understand them all, but I think the translation is really good. So, but he says, he exalted Christ far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. You see that? He's using all these words to try to help us understand a little better how exalted he is. Um, you know, I'm not going to fool with it, but there's just, there's just a lot of these things. He's above all, listen, he's above all popes. He's above all governors. He's above all presidents. He's above all prime ministers. He's above all kings. He's above all tribal leaders, oligarchs, or whatever else there might be. Jesus is exalted above all those. Amen? Because of the power of God. The text says that he's above every name presently. <laughs> this, is, this is good. Think about it. He says, and he's above every name. Every name that is named. Think, whoever you want to think of. You know how awesome and how powerful our God is? Think of whoever you want to think of. Put their name down and he's above their name. And now you can go back uh, and forwards and you can go not only in this age of everybody you can think of, but we can go ahead and move forward into the age that's going to come, and anybody that's going to come, he's still above them too. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So that's what he's trying to help us understand. And Paul writes something similar like this to the church at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, he says this. He says, Therefore, God, 
talking about Christ, has highly exalted. And I remember this Greek word, highly exalted. It's, it's, it's like one of those words that it's a super saturated type thing. It's, it's like, you know, he's exalted him so high, the word is, is like, you can't exalt him anymore. And he's continually being exalted. And, and you know, it, it's, it's just one of those words that really don't, you can't define it. Immeasurable, so to speak. He's highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. That's exactly what he was saying to the Ephesians. And he says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, there's no one with more power than our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one. Everyone and everything is subject to him. And guess what? As the church, we are the body of Christ. And you look at those last two verses, verses 22 and 23. In Ephesians chapter 1, you see this. And he put all things under his feet, what we've just been talking about. Jesus is the head over all things to the church, and the church is what? It's his body. You see that? We're the body of Christ. Christ is our spiritual head, he, and through the Spirit, we are united with him. The head and the body, they go together. So we're tied in with him and his power. You see that? Praise the Lord. It, it means that we share in his resurrection and in his ascension and his exaltation. And if you are one of his, if you're one of the people of faith, then you're identified in Christ and you can know his power. You can know his power. You can experience his power. Oh, man. Lord, show us your power. Amen? He's already showed it to us, right? But do it again. <laughs> Oh, man. Herbert Jackson was a missionary, and uh, he was assigned a car that wouldn't start. And uh, he learned that you know, he could push it. I guess it was a manual transmission, but he could push it and turn it over and start it. And, and um, so for, for years while he was a missionary, he had always tried to park the car on a hill so he could roll it off or he'd you know, make sure he had some people with him to help him get it rolling, to, to, to get it cranked off. And, and um, you know, and he just he did that for a couple of years, and and um, he he got a little bit uh, of a help problem, and he was having to leave the field, and they sent a replacement. And when they sent the replacement missionary, uh, Jackson started sharing with him, you know, his arrangement with the car, or what he needed to do. And the guy says, "Oh, wait a minute!" He said, "Just he popped the hood, and he he got under the hood, and he got to looking around, and and he says, "You know what?" He says, "It, it looks like." Um, you have a loose cable. He says, let me just move that over and tighten that up for you. And he did. And he hopped in the car. Bam. Started right up. <laughs> of course, for two years, he had needlessly went through this routine of making sure he had somebody with him to push the car off or making sure he parked it somewhere where it would roll off and start. And the only problem was all the time, even though the power was there, the connection was loose. I know some of you are shaking your heads. You already know where I'm going with this. How great is the power available to us who believe in God? Oh, man, it's immeasurable. Immeasurable power. Undefinable power. Unbelievable power. But oh, how often we devise plans to try to do things without it on our own because there's not really a connection. You know, we miss that connection. Oh, man, God help us. You know, you can know him. And when you really know him, and to really know him, you have to spend time with him. Spend some time in his word. Spend some time praying and seeking God and, and following hard after God and obeying him. And then, I think, then we'll see the power of God. You can have access to that power. 
when you're connected to Christ. And so I want to ask you, have you experienced the power of God in your life? Do you know Him? Many years ago, I, I, I approached a, a young lady uh, in our church and asked her to go out to a movie, maybe a dinner. I don't remember. Do you remember? Movie? Did we have dinner? Yeah, I think so too. Her name was Christy Atkins. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that, that was a long time ago. But you know, what I want to tell you is the reason I, I approached her was because even though I already knew her a little bit, I really wanted to get to know her more, you know? And in order to accomplish that, I had to spend some time with her. And she had to want to spend some time with me. So I tricked her into doing that. And, um, <laughs> you know, <coughs> but anyway, I want to tell you something. Our great God, the creator of this universe, has approached you through his incarnation and his life and complete revelation, not because he wants to know you better. He already knows everything about you. But because he wants you to know him. He wants you to know him. And you can know him. And when you know him, when you really know him, you can know his love. You can know his hope, and you can know his power. Amen. And some of you today, you really need that. Some of you today, you really need to know him. <clears throat> and I want to ask you will, will, will you come to him today? He's standing arms open wide, he's waiting on you. The invitation is there. All you have to do is embrace Him and know Him and experience Him. And we're here to help you do that. Let's all stand together and uh, let's respond as God speaks to our hearts. Father, we bow before You right now, Lord. We're thankful that You long to know us, know that we know You. <laughs> Lord, we're thankful that You made a way for us to know You and experience You and, Lord, to enjoy You forever. Right now, Lord, we pray that you'd have your way in the hearts and minds of all of us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.